Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next presentation. Um, so this is uh, John Wynn, and he's going to go through updating the Open Compute Voltage Step Response requirement. So this is mainly for uh, uh, HPC environments or very, uh, very high powered racks. So okay, go ahead, John. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're going to talk about the updating this OCP Compute Voltage Step Response Specification, uh, another case study we had uh, based on our Tundra ES design. So we'll talk a little about Penguin, uh, why we care about OCP standards, uh, about the voltage instability under certain workloads, uh, the cluster config we had to deal with, um, as well as root cause analysis. Uh, the product we came out with was the cap shelf and possible future upgrades to it. Uh, of course, if you have any questions at any time, please go ahead and interrupt. Uh, the microphone's here, and I think we have some other microphones floating around. So Penguin is a 20-year-old startup for uh, HPC hardware, software, and services. Um, we are also home to the skilled Beowulf cluster management software. It's free software you can use to manage your cluster, as well as a bare metal HPC on cloud, uh, which is uh, basically HPC on demand. We call Penguin Competing On Demand, or POD. Uh, we have delivered also 300 OCP racks to date, based on Tundra Extreme Scale Design, Tundra ES. Uh, as mentioned in the other presentation, uh, we're looking for OCP Inspire for the branding on this. Uh, we believe it does meet the specification, and it'll be up for review by the Incubations Committee in Q2. Um, we're also a Platinum OCP member. Uh, the branding is on the right-hand side. And the Penguin CTO, Philip Corney, is also a member of the OCP Incubation Committee as a HPC representative. So about the voltage instability under dynamic workloads. So what we had was a case where the power shelf couldn't respond quickly enough to the rapid transition of the power state. Uh, we basically had 64 nodes starting off, and we would go from medium to full power, and we saw the 12 volt roll sag. And then we had 64 nodes at the same time, same microsecond, it would go from full to idle, and then the 12 volt rail surged. So basically we had this, this slew rate issue, if you guys recognize that. Uh, it was basically high-speed, low-latency fabric setup. Um, the workload was synchronized within microseconds, which is why it was such a big problem for us. We just couldn't predict it. And our initial application was based on LAMPs, but we wanted to double-check. So we actually worked on other, other workloads, and we found the same issues. So we had a sag, we had a surge, slew rate. And this is the node, one of the 64 that was used in the build. It's relying on OCP 1930E. Uh, it's based on a dual Intel Xeon design from the previous generation. Uh, 128 gigs DDR4 memory, based on an 8 by 16 gig, as well as Intel OmniPath 100, uh, diskless boot, and also this air-cooled. Uh, you'll notice that the sled here is actually a local-cooled design. We, we have another variant, which is air-cooled. So this is just used for an example. Um, this sled also will be submitted for uh, Q2 to the Foundation for Technical Review, so everybody will have access to an OSP marketplace. And again, we had 64 nodes of these on the rack. And this is the rack in question. It's an Oakbridge rack, a 40 OU form factor, a single zone, 26 kilowatt, uh, redundant, 5 wire, 277 40 volt at 60 amps, uh, based on the Vertiv Netsure rectifier design and a power shelf. Now I'll let her take the picture. <laughs> All right. All right, so basically at uh, high node density, um, we found that we were exceeding the slew rate per shelf. And uh, the symptom shows up at scale. So we have from 64 up to 576 nodes. We didn't see this at the smaller node counts, only when we scaled it up. And we figured it was an HPC thing. We increased 50% of the nodes, and you'll see it immediately. Kind of like when you test memory, you do the burn-in, and you have to do maybe 1,000 nodes in order to find out what it is, but it takes 24 hours to find it. Just maybe those couple different errors. But normally, if you do maybe only eight hours of burn-in, you won't see that issue. So in the cause analysis, uh, we went back, looked at the Intel data sheet, and uh, for those of you who have worked with Intel, you know that sometimes the documentation is not quite as accurate as it could be, especially with the, uh, the current years. Um, the CPU was drawing more power than it was actually stated. So TP said, okay, well, it's gonna be this value. We found out within four milliseconds, or up to four milliseconds, the value would actually be exceeded. 
Uh, we kind of knew this would happen. For example, when you do turbo boost on Intel CPUs, you'll see that. Um, and they do kind of warn you ahead of time. They just don't write it down in the documentation. You have to actually test it to find out what it is. And we found this not just in Xeon, but also Atom processors. It's, it's well known now. Um, the cluster power for specifications based on a calculated power budget um, off of the TDP value off the data sheet. So we really didn't know how much it would exceed. You have to keep measuring it, see you know, what would be value, and, and figure out what the average would be. Um, so we had this position. We said, OK, should we over-vision? Should we over-engineer the rack? A um, lot of scenarios to think about. And we, we kind of didn't want to have to go too much into it because, I mean, if you try to compensate for one side, you're going to overcompensate and not figure out the other scenarios that might come in play. So unfortunately, what happened happened, and we had to figure a way around it. So here's the design we came out with to try to prove a concept. Uh, it's a capacitor shelf. Um, basically, it's to address the slew rate issue, not the total power, because again, this is not a total power issue or power budget. It's actually just the change in the 12 volt rail. So we basically made this prototype with uh, six large capacitors connected directly to bus bars to see whether or not it'd be effective. And we also designed an additional safety feature, which is the charge discharge circuit. And it's based on a total of one farad or one million microfarads inside one shelf. And the great news is that it worked. So that was fantastic for the customer. And also it did pass uh, compliance and safety. Uh, it has been submitted. There's a report online publicly. Um, so we call this the capacitor shelf, uh, used as a power buffering solution. So for future upgrades, what we're hoping to do is to put this design, miniaturize it into uh, each of the nodes. So we have many different capacitors instead of just one large shelf with all the capacitors in it. Uh, we're also in discussion with the power supply manufacturer to see if they can possibly increase the slew rate for theirs, uh, uh, for their technical specification for HPC applications. And uh, one of the recommendations uh, for everybody in the community is that whether or not we can increase the uh, open rack power specification so we can have around 2,000 amps uh, per microsecond. Uh, we came to that design based on, uh, let me go back to this other slide, um, based on the rectifier uh, types of specification and multiplied by the number of nodes. All right. Okay, now we're up for discussion. Uh, anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? I can't be that good of a presenter. You guys must have some questions. <laughs> Hi, Ed Massey, a method. Um, so you've talked about, you know, dealing with a slew rate with the capacitive system. How, did you find that you actually had to beef up the infrastructure? in terms of all the cabling interconnect as well to support that kind of slew rate or just manage it? Because it looks like you have one shelf that's got to support a fairly decent sized rack or do you put multiple shelves in a rack? I'm just trying to figure out the infrastructure implication for it. Uh, Alex, do you happen to know if we have more than one power shelf, the, the capacitor shelf inside the, uh, the Tundra? So Mike Bashu, um, quick question on what you did in trying to understand what the power supplies are actually capable of doing and what their specification are, because 2,000 amps per microsecond on a 15 kVA distribu or 15 kW distribution is, I think, kind of egregious. Yeah, I, I understand. It's we're trying to maybe again overcompensate for uh, for the design. Uh, yeah, just trying to answer the previous question. So normally we just need one um, capacitor shelf, um, but it is possible to add the other one in the rack. Yeah, it's kind of similar to the idea that we wanted to put all the capacitors inside the nodes themselves. Um, there's actually somebody out there, a vendor that I used to work with that uh, does that. They have a UPS built in, so instead of having redundant power, you have a kind of a UPS or a power buffering solution built in along with the redundant power supply. Uh, and save the same module, the same form factor. So. Uh, Alex, uh, about the, uh, the other gentleman's question about the, uh, the amount of power, 2,000 amps versus one microsecond, uh, he feels that it's a little bit overpowered. Um, do you have the same opinion or? Um, 
Okay, I think it might be some kind of a theoretical versus the, the practical. So that power shift we have been used in at least more than 100 racks in, in the field with a consumer. So I, there might be some um, bios, but still that, that's why we are still working on the new design. Um, so um, for, to address that, the, the second gen product might be a, a smaller a composite unit inside the chassis instead of using a power shift. Yeah, that's why it's up for discussion. I mean, this is, this is a proposed value, but it may be a little too much or maybe too little. So welcome any opinions. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you.